If you've gardened, you've likely heard that it is more important to feed the soil than to feed your plants, and that compost is a key to a thriving, productive garden. If you don't garden, you've likely heard about composting as a way to live a more sustainable, eco-friendly life and support the planet. No matter who you are, no matter why you're coming to composting, I think by now we've all heard about it in some capacity and know that it is important for our homes, our gardens, and the planet. But it can be confusing. (laughs) There are green to brown ratios, expensive contraptions, and processes that you need to learn about. Not to mention, it can smell if you don't do it right. And for us trying to compost indoors, that is a huge hard pass, right? So for that reason, we're dedicating an entire episode to everything you need to know about composting in order to support your garden, yourselves, and the earth. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care. my plant friends. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Maria, the host of the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, and I'm here to help you grow joy by caring for plants successfully, or sometimes caring for soil successfully when we talk about compost today. If you're returning, welcome home. Welcome back, my plant friends. It's so nice to be a part of your weekly journey for developing your knowledge about houseplant care, gardening, and self-care through plant care. I'm so excited to talk about today's episode all about composting. So, you know, we're not talking about plant care, but we're talking about compost creation, which is an aspect of soil care, which supports our plants in the garden. Our guest, Michelle Baltz, is a super expert on composting. She doesn't have one, but two books all dedicated to composting to give us an introduction to why it's so important and all of the different ways available to us to compost in a way that makes sense for our lifestyle. So by the end of this episode, you're going to understand what compost is made of, how it affects the soil, why it's important for the environment, why it's important for your gardens, and how to compost both indoors, spoiler alert, worms are involved, and outdoors. And before we dive in to this insanely informative episode, I wanted to share my personal composting journey because I want to be honest (laughs) and transparent about what that's looked like. So if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you knew that I was a plant killer. I was super disconnected from the earth, from nature. I didn't see plants as living things. And when I started caring for houseplants, all of a sudden I noticed that I started noticing the trees, noticing nature, wanting to go hiking, wanting to care about the planet a little bit more. So my composting journey has started with me not composting, right, for the majority of my life. And then when I was living in New York City, they had a composting program where we tried it, we did our best to do it, but our compost bin smelled. And then in the pandemic, the composting program got shut down. So that was kind of a miss. But that's where I got introduced to the power of composting your personal food scraps. And then when I moved to the woods, I ended up getting this tabletop composter, we'll put composter in quotes, called the Lomi. I'm sure you've seen a bunch of different, there's a bunch of different options for these tabletop composters on the market, but they essentially take your excess food waste and dehydrate it and break it down into potting mix, into soil. True composters like Michelle aren't going to call the Lomi a composter per se, because the result is dehydrated and it's not a living thing the way compost is kind of a living, breathing, ever-changing thing. So some people refer to, you know, what comes out of my Lomi as pre-compost, but I have to say it has completely changed my life. Billy and I have now composted. We've put our food waste in the Lomi for two years, every single night. So at the end, we save our food scraps all day. And then after dinner, we put our food scraps in the Lomi and we turn it on and we let it run overnight. And in the morning, it's just soil. It's just potting mix that we could either put in our garden with our houseplants. We choose to just dump it in the forest outside and just kind of return it to the earth and let it kind of become alive again by assimilating with the earth. You can also put it in your compost pile, right? But Yes, the product has been great. But for me, what it, the beauty of the Lomi is it's really opened my eyes to how much food waste and how much stuff is going into our garbage that shouldn't. Michelle talks about the detrimental effects of food waste in your garbage, food waste in these 
huge dumps, but I used to throw food scraps and eggshells into my garbage without thinking twice about it, right? And my garbage would smell and I would take my garbage out almost every day. Since we've been using the Lomi, we've really gotten out of the habit of putting our food scraps in our garbage. We've reduced our taking our garbage out, you know, probably by 50%. Our garbage doesn't smell anymore. But more importantly, I have really gotten in tune with the importance of food waste not going into our garbage. Now, if we had to send our Lomi in for repairs and like we didn't have it for a week and it was painful to be putting food scraps in the garden. And I can't put my food scraps outside locally because we have too many bears and wildlife. So anyway, I will say if you're a newbie and if you're looking for like a low maintenance composting option where it's kind of a good gateway drug for composting, you know, throughout this conversation, you're going to hear at the end of it, like, I'm so excited to have a true compost bin on my property when I'm not renting when, you know, I have more control over my space. But I do have to say as a beginner product, the Lomi has been incredible. If you want to learn more about it, you can go to growingjoywithmaria.com slash Lomi, L-O-M-I. And I believe the code growing joy will get you $50 off of Lomi if you're interested. But I just wanted to, I'm not giving this to you as a sales pitch. I'm just telling you that like this process of getting rid of my food scraps has really opened my eyes to a greater world of composting and earth care and eco-friendly things. And I'm obsessed with it. So anyway, we'll link to everything in the show notes if you're interested. But without further ado, enough chit chat, Maria, about your personal experience. Let's get to it. Michelle gives us so many amazing, so much amazing insight into composting. So here she is. Michelle, welcome to Growing Joy. I have so many questions for you about composting. I'm so excited to dig in for lack of a better plant pun. That sounds great. I'm happy to be here. So you've written two books on composting. You're a composting expert. How does one become a composting expert? What has your journey been in composting? Well, I composted as a small child, but really it was more just bringing scraps to my mom's pile. So I really started composting in 2006 when I purchased a home and I uh, really wanted to, to be able to garden more and have better soil for my gar- my new garden. And I was excited to you know have my own little piece of land. I, it's, I live in an urban setting, so it's a small backyard, but it was still mine. Where do you live? I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so I got a uh, one of the black plastic composters, which I still have and love. She's my favorite composter. I still use it. And I got one of those and I just fell in love. It's a remarkable thing when you can take scraps that most people consider garbage and then turn them into something so valuable and useful for your garden. I love it. And what does your garden look like in Cincinnati? So what, your zone five, six? Yeah, I, th- I think I'm zone six. So my garden, I, my property is on a hill. So it's terrace, um, cool. terrace garden. So the front yard, I have no grass. It is all um, just, you know, perennials and ivy and a lot of rock walls. I have, I am, my house was built in 1922. And so I have rock stairs going up, rock walls all over the place. And then the backyard is terraced. And I do have a few raised beds for vegetables, um, but mostly I grow herbs. And so I have just every herb I can buy at the garden store I have I have in my backyard and I try to use them all. And then I do have a few potted plants on my patio too for tomatoes. I feel like they just grow better in the in the pots. Do you grow your herbs in the ground? I do almost all my herbs except for my mint. I grow that in a pot because it just spreads like crazy. Yeah. So you're growing because a lot where you live, a lot of those herbs are annual. So you're replanting your herb landscape every year. Not necessarily. So because I have south facing rock walls, I feel like maybe I'm cheating the system a little bit. Most of my herbs come back. The ones that I do have to plant every year are parsley, basil, cilantro. Yeah, cilantro, which I have not been able to really effectively plant. I plant it every year, but it and it just goes like crazy. And it's never ready when my tomatoes are ready. That's a struggle (laughs) for me. But um, my lavender, my sage, all of that comes back every year. Oh my gosh. So nice. I love that. And what is, how many different composting systems do you have in your home now? Because I assume you've probably tried them all at this point. I have tried them all. So right now I have a black plastic composter. I have 
three wire bins. I have a wooden um, two bay compost system. Those are the active ones that I'm using, but I've tried everything that I've written out in my books. I've tried all of those systems. So cool. And don't be intimidated or overwhelmed if you didn't understand any of those words. We're going to be gentle on the audience today. I want to start with the basics. And then I really do want to kind of pick your brain about all the different opportunities, because I think there's a lot of different opportunities for composting for different homes, for different zones, for different lifestyles. And I'd love for this episode to inspire people to try new stuff. But before we dive into the different modalities of composting, let's talk about just some definitions. What is compost versus soil versus potting mix? So we'll hit composting first. So just like when you are gardening, you're deciding what plants grow where. When you're composting, you're deciding what decomposes and where you're going to have it. And so you're creating a system where you're you're intentionally decomposing materials in order to make use of that in your garden and to create a, a valuable soil amendment. So what you're creating with compost is a soil amendment. It's not actually soil. Soil is going to have uh, little bits of rock, the sand, silt, and clay. They're going to have um, minerals. Um, they're going to have more than the compost has in it, if that makes sense. So the compost is much like the humus layer. It's the top layer of soil. It's going to have all of the, the great additives for the soil. Potting mix is really a median created specifically for potted material. So it can have compost in it. It can have soil in it. It's going to be, you know, a little airier, a little fluffier, but it's really intended for potting. So I think that those are the big differences, especially between soil and compost. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is soil is the OG. Soil is what's outdoors occurring naturally, evolved over millennia on our earth. Compost is what we're adding to outdoor soil to amend it. So compost is an amendment that has all the good nutrients that we all hear about as gardeners. Potting soil is a little bit more sterile, fluffier, because if you listen to this podcast, you know you cannot plant your house plants in outdoor soil because it's too dense. And potting mix is meant for potted plants. So what is in compost? So what makes compost so special? What are the elements of compost that are so important for our gardens and also for the world? Yeah. So compost, when you're breaking down leaves and banana peels and all the food scraps, it does have a lot of really important nutrients in it. Your plants need 16 essential nutrients to survive. They're getting the oxygen and the hydrogen from the air and the water, but they need those other nutrients. And so compost has those nutrients in it just from a lot of the nutrients, not all of them, just from the materials that you're adding. But the real magic of compost is what it does to your soil. So when you are adding that compost, it, it's alive. It has microorganisms in it and it has a, a really good structure. And so when you're adding that to the soil, you are bringing that material and those organisms to the soil, which is also living. A lot of times we don't think about the whole ecosystem that's under our feet, but it's there. And so by adding that that compost, you're amending that soil and creating a better environment for those microorganisms to live. So you're not only adding the nutrients, but a lot of times people will say fertilizer is for feeding plants, but compost is for feeding soil. So you are actually creating a better environment for those microorganisms that are essential for plants to be able to get the nutrients that they need out of the soil. Um, you have what are called nitrogen fixing bacteria, which live in harmony with the, the plant's roots. And adding that compost is just going to create a better environment for those organisms. And it's going to, in the end, create healthier plants. And why do you think composting is such a big conversation, even globally right now? Like, What are all of the benefits of composting for the earth, for ourselves, for our gardens? Yeah. So when we send our food scraps to the landfill, you know, they're just burying them in a hole. And it and when they decompose in the landfill, they're creating methane, which is a greenhouse gas way, way stronger than carbon dioxide, which is what we create when we naturally decompose the material in our compost bins. And so you're not only trucking the material to a hole in the ground, you're also creating a, a really strong greenhouse gas. 
when we are composting in our backyards, we're reducing that, we're eliminating that, but we're also creating a really valuable material out of something that was waste. And so you're amending your soils, but there's also something kind of magical that happens with plants, especially trees and bushes and things that are long lived plants. As you know, as you probably learned in like second grade, those plants like trees are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and they are bringing it down into their roots. And if you have really healthy soil, your soil can actually act as a carbon sink. Yes. Carbon sequestration. What a big hot topic these days. I know. So you can pull that carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil. And as you know, that's a big deal right now. We're trying to find ways to reduce our carbon, but this is actually reversing it. It's actually not only you're saving that carbon from going to the landfill, but you are actually creating a healthier environment for your plants so they can store that carbon in the soil. If you follow me on Instagram, you know that I've become quite the bird lady. Obviously, I have Rangi, my parakeet, who you hear in all of our (laughs) podcast conversations, but I've become like a crazy hummingbird lady. I have multiple hummingbird feeders outside my house. I have trained them to come sit on my finger and drink from my hummingbird feeders, and I have bird feeders as well. Birds have brought me so much joy, arguably maybe even more joy than my actual garden. Like the birds that come to my garden and that come to these feeders have brought me more joy than anything else. And as I have delved into the joy of bringing birds to my garden, I found my new favorite book. I can't believe there's a book dedicated just to this, Bird Friendly Gardening by Jen McGinnis, okay? It is a book all about planting a wildlife, welcoming home landscape filled with diversity of native plants that feed, shelter, and support birds. So you can actually strategically plant your garden with birds in mind to attract more birds to your garden so you don't even need the bird feeders. There are hundreds of North American bird species facing population decline and at the risk of extinction. And right now is the perfect time to create a home-based habitat garden that offers birds the resources they need to safely feed, migrate, breed, and thrive. If you love birds and gardening, you have to get this book. I'm so obsessed. She has bird-friendly projects for tiny gardens, for expansive gardens, like whatever type of garden you're working with, even if it's just a little flower box, she will help you attract more birds to your home. And I love that she has a breakdown of all the different birds and what kinds of plants each bird eats. So if you really want to attract more blue jays, you'll know what type of plants to plant versus hummingbirds. Get this book, Bird Friendly Gardening, Bring Birds to Your Garden, Experience the Insane Joy It Brings Me, (laughs) and Hopefully Brings You. I'm fully on the verge of being a full-blown crazy bird lady who takes bird watching vacations, and I don't care who knows it. So grab Bird Friendly Gardening by Jen McGinnis and fill your garden with bird song. Pick it up at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon. That's Bird Friendly Gardening by Jen McGinnis. So on a whole episode dedicated to making your own compost, I hear that some of you might not have composting in your journeys at this moment, right? There might be reasons why you don't want to create a home compost for yourself. But if you want the benefits of compost in your garden and you don't want the hassle of making it, you should grab Espoma Organics composts to add to your garden on your next garden center run. So Espoma Organic has two different types of compost. The one that I use and love is the teal bag, and it's called the Land and Sea Gourmet Compost. It's enhanced with crab and lobster shells from the sea, along with mycotone, their proprietary blend of mycorrhizae that help build strong roots and better plants. The gray bag is the mushroom compost blend. If you don't want to be putting sea creatures in your garden, it combines rich mushroom compost with aged forest products to make the perfect soil conditioner. Both of these composts are great for planting vegetables, flowers, trees, and shrubs, amending your soil, making it more rich and healthy and happy. It's got that mycotone that is going to help enhance the mycorrhizae network in your garden. So go get them. And in addition to the composts, you know, if you're gardening outdoors, Espoma has potting soils, fertilizers, soil amendments, and even houseplant fertilizer. But whatever you're growing in your garden or in your indoor collection, Espoma has the soil or fertilizer for you. To learn more about all of the indoor and outdoor products Espoma has to offer, you can go to espoma.com to find your local dealer, or you can go to my Amazon storefront and I have a curated list of all the Espoma products that I use in my garden and houseplant collection. Thank you, Espoma. 
Yeah, I mean, that's so interesting, because from a sustainability perspective, so many people are like, well, what can I even do? Like, we're so far beyond saving the earth, you know, and what is my little plot of land going to do? But it is so interesting that if everybody had gardens with healthy soil, think about even if each of us are only sequestering a little bit on a large scale, if everybody had a little garden, you know, in our country or in the world, that would create really incredible impact. And are you saying that it's not necessarily the plants, but it's the healthy soil that captures that carbon? So say, if I was to plant a tomato just like in the dirt outside in my property, but then next door, I amended the soil with compost and I planted that tomato in the ground, the composted tomato is going to sequester more carbon than the one that's just like stuck in the in the dirt? Yes, you have to have a healthy soil environment for that to really stay in the soil. And so the healthier the soil, the more of a carbon sink it's going to act as. Um, there's also, if you get into kind of the regenerative agriculture, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's the no-till method and making, and that also helps keep the carbon in the soil and not, you know, let it escape into the atmosphere. Yeah, no-till. You got to have a lot of patience with no-till, which I'm also learning a lot about as I hopefully move this year and own land for the first time. And I've been daydreaming about my gardens and the composting system. So this episode is very selfish in addition to, you know, creating this educational content for all the listeners So we talked about the importance of compost for the earth, but what about for gardeners? What are the benefits that using compost in your garden is really going to help? I do think this conversation gardeners have about feeding the soil instead of feeding your plants is really important because if you have overall healthy soil, I think you're going to have more robust plants. But can you speak more to all the little microorganisms and, and all the cool stuff going on that is actually going to impact our plants? Absolutely. So I think for gardeners, a few things. When you're adding compost to the soil, you're helping your soil have a better relationship with water is kind of how I look at it. So if you have really sandy soils and you add compost to your soil, that soil is going to hold water better than it used to because sandy soil, it would just run right through. If you have really heavy clay soils like we do in our area, adding compost is going to help that soil not hold on. The clay soils just hold on to the water almost and won't let it go. It will help break up that soil, help add air to the soil. It's going to help your soil act more like a sponge. So it will hold on to the water. So you have to water less and it will provide the water when your plants need it. It's also going to help reduce erosion. When you have rainfalls and you have unprotected soils, it's going to wash that soil away. It's going to um, create kind of a crust layer on top. But if you have a, a nice air, like almost like a mulch of, of compost or just mulch, that's going to help protect your soils from the erosion from rain. But also, it, like I said, it provides the nutrients, which I think is really important, and it helps aerate the soil. So you're getting the air into the soil that your plants need. Mm. And so you just brought up mulch, mulch the layer of, you know, straw or, you know, leaf leaves or whatever that we're putting on top. Is mulching your garden part of composting? Because the, the idea is that mulch ultimately kind of composts itself and returns to the soil, right? So is that the lowest phi composting method? I think so. I mean, I think if you are mulching, you are technically composting. You're protecting your soils, which is really important, you know, Um, but you're also, that material breaks down over time. And so that is decomposing. It's adding to the soil. A lot of people will use their finished compost as mulch. So they will um, screed it and just add it as a top layer on top of plants as you would, you know, the wood mulch that you would buy from the store. And that is a really nice way of not only displaying the beautiful compost that you created, but of using it and not having to dig it into the soil too much. Well, and then I guess as you're watering, you probably don't even need to fertilize your plants that much throughout the season, because as you water, you're basically watering the compost into the soil every time. Right. You definitely have to use less fertilizers when you are composting. And I wouldn't say it completely replaces fertilizer. I mean, sometimes your soil just doesn't have what it needs and the compost can't provide it, but it's definitely, it will help reduce your fertilizer use. Yeah. I, one season, a couple of years ago, gardened with one of my best plant friends, Melody. She was 80 and had the most stunning garden. She had the most stunning soil I've ever seen. And it was, you know, three decades of cultivating the soil. 
And her practice was that she would mulch with straw. And then whenever she was pruning, you know, whenever she was maintaining the garden, she would just throw the scraps into the walkways between the beds and also with straw and with leaves and with whatever else. And then, you know, she let those pathways get beaten down with our feet and then throughout the winter. And then her practice was she would change the direction of the beds every year. So basically those pathways would get scooped into the beds when she would just like slightly move them. She didn't have raised beds, but she had like mounded gardening, I guess. I don't know what you would call it. And her soil was like the most stunning thing I've ever seen. It was incredible. You'd pick up just a piece and there'd be like three earthworms and all sorts of, you know, bugs and roly polies. And, you know, that's also what's the importance of compost for worms and other organisms that are also going to help with plants? Because that was something I noticed, particularly in Melody's garden, like so many worms, so many little, you know, whatever those roly polies are called, you know, all of those little bugs that seemed like they were a really vital part of that ecosystem that she had created. Yeah. And I would say that that is the part of the eco soil ecosystem that you can see. So just like with the microorganisms, you're creating an environment where those organisms want to live, right? They're, you know, they can move, the earthworm can move around easily through the soil. You also get predators, you know, little tiny predators in the soil. So they're eating, you know, like centipedes that are eating, you know, the, the uh, little baby earthworms and, and those kinds of things. So definitely when you are adding compost, you're just creating a better environment for those organisms. They need air, they need water, even though it's underground, they need those things. And if your soil is really compacted and you don't have, um, you know, a nice humus layer of compost, you're going to have less water and less air and less life in your soil. Yeah, it's so cool. And what's the saying? It's like one teaspoon of soil has like a million organisms in it or something. Yeah, I think it's like a billion. Yeah, it, you know, and the, most of those are bacteria, but yeah, they, it is alive and it's not something that I think we as gardeners fully appreciate. Yeah, we've talked about mycorrhizae a little bit on the podcast as well. Does compost help support the mycorrhizae? And I guess, does compost have the mycorrhizae in it already? It does. And so the fungus family, they really come in at the end of the compost party is how I look at it. They are, I mean, they, they're there the whole time, but they are the ones who are really breaking down the heavy woody material and they take longer to do that. So that's why when you, um, you know, if you take a year to compost at the end, the things you're going to see the most are the sticks and maybe wood chips, those kinds of things. They take longer to break down, but the fungus are critical to doing that. I love that. Okay, let's dive in to composting 101. Let's start with what goes in the compost and what doesn't go in the compost, because this is a whole art. So what can we compost and what can we not compost? So a good way of looking at it is if it came from a plant, you can compost it. So if it is a vegetable or a food scrap, you can compost it. Or a house plant, dead house plant. Yes. So those are the things that you really want to compost. And if you're just starting out, I recommend you start with just fresh fruits and vegetables, right? Save the cooked broccoli for when you're really good at it. Once you get that under your belt, then you can compost things like pasta or old stale crackers, but you, you kind of want to step into that. So if you're just starting, I usually recommend just fresh fruits and vegetables. Things you don't want to compost, meat, dairy, any kind of eggs. Um, you can do compost eggshells though. That's the exception. You don't want to compost any animal. Like if you have um, a cat or a dog, you don't want to add that to your backyard compost. Those kind of pathogens in them. Anything that's really oily. So lettuce is great, but if you have completely covered it in salad dressing, a little bit is not going to hurt, but um, you will notice kind of a garbagey smell coming from that as it decomposes. So it's really the smell that you're trying to avoid. So that's those are the things you want to avoid. Things like coffee grounds are great. And tea bags, 98% of them are great. They're made of a fiber that's going to break down. There are a few companies that make tea bags that, that are plastic, that are little plastic mesh bags. If you can't tear it, then it's probably plastic and you want to get rid of those. I personally don't buy them, but I've seen them before. Um, so 
you want to be careful with those. Yeah. We put our coffee filters too, like the brown paper coffee filters and brown paper bags too, right? I'm also going to guess, depending on what your composting system is, a more intense composting system can probably take more intense levels of food or cardboard or whatever versus probably something that's more passive that's going to be more just like all the fresh foods like you talked about, which we'll dive into when when we talk about this. I know something that intimidates me for my next journey is the ratio. People talk about the green to brown ratio of this. So is the ratio of, of what goes into the compost important in general for most composting systems? It is. And it's all about keeping those microorganisms happy. And you need to have um, about one part green material, so like fresh fruits and vegetables, that kind of thing, to three parts brown materials. And that's going to be, for most people, they're brown dead leaves. If you're able to shred up those leaves, that's even better. You're going to get finished compost faster. But you want three parts brown to one part green. Now, there's a few exceptions to that. Um, Coffee grounds are considered a green, even though they're brown in color. They are high in nitrogen. And that is what we're trying to balance is the nitrogen to carbon. So those microorganisms need both of those materials about in that ratio. You do not need to get out of scale or measuring cups. Um, You can eyeball it. It'll be fine. And some people lean more towards, you know, two parts brown to one part green. And once you get it, you know, to be a better composter, you can you can try that out. But really starting with that magic three parts brown to one part green is going to give you a perfect balance of the nitrogen and carbon, keep those microorganisms happy and get you finished compost faster. And what happens if I don't do that? So because what I'm thinking is if most of my compost, if most of my stuff is food scraps that I'm throwing away and I don't have three times the amount of food scraps that I have, is it not going to be compost? Is it going to be toxic? Like how um, dire is this problem if I don't have enough brown to green? So it will decompose regardless of what you do. It will decompose. Um, the pro- you may face some problems. It, it might smell. It might attract fruit flies if you've got too much green um, that you're not covering up. It might not have enough air in it as it decomposes, and it might go anaerobic, which we can talk about a little bit more later, but it will decompose. Um, Now, if you have the opposite problem and you only are composting your brown material, so you just have a leaf bin, it will just decompose very slowly, but it will decompose. Your leaves are going to decompose with that. So the nitrogen in the green is what accelerates the brown composting. And then the brown is what kind of slows it down and manages the pest issue. You mentioned anaerobic. Let's talk about that. So what do we need to know anaerobic, aerobic when it comes to composting and maybe signals that we might have a problem? Right. So you want when you're back air composting, you want aerobic composting. So you, that means that you have bacteria that are aerobic or air loving bacteria that are, you know, doing the material breakdown. They break down material faster. They're the ones they don't create methane, which is the, you know, a strong greenhouse gas, and they aren't going to create strong odors. If your pile goes anaerobic, so you have anaerobic or um, bacteria that don't like air, it's going to be more like really slow decomposition, like in a swamp. And um, it smells, gonna, it can have a sulfur smell or, you know, just a bad odor. And it's really slow and it's creating methane. So it will decompose. It's going to turn into compost. It'll be okay, but you're just going to have those odors. It's going to take a really long time. So that's why we recommend that you add the three parts brown to one part green and that you add air every once in a while. That's going to help reduce that. So if you do happen to go out, and I've had this happen, I haven't turned it in a while. I go out and I smell the pile. And you can tell almost immediately, like, that doesn't smell right. It's likely that your pile has gone anaerobic and you can change it in a day. You can All you have to do is fluff up that pile, get some air down in it, and that bacteria are going to switch and they're going to be aerobic bacteria. It'll be fine. But... Yes, that is likely what will happen. If you only have food scraps, you're just not going to have enough carbon. The carbon are what the little microorganisms use to kind of build their bodies, for for lack of a better term. So you do need that. It does help those microorganisms. Interesting. Okay. I love this. 
So I guess let's start with walking through the different types of composting, right? Let's talk about composting for indoors first, because some people don't have outdoor spaces. And then we can kind of move into the different options for outdoors. So what are a couple options for indoor gardeners, people in apartments, people that are worried about the smell, you know, worried about the grossness of it and but looking to really manage their food scraps? Okay, great. So No Waste Composting, which is the second book I wrote, I highlighted a whole chapter on small space composting that you can do either in your kitchen or on a patio or a you know, fire escape. And there's a few methods. The most common method is probably vermicomposting. So composting with worms. I know you were, you're telling me to get worms in my apartment. I'm worried about <laughs> mice and you're saying, no, get a bunch of, a whole bunch of worms. Yeah. So how does vermicomposting work? Right. So the red wigglers, they're Isonita fetida is the name. So they're special little tiny worms. You don't just go out and like pick out some earthworms and yeah. throw them in a bin. They're not going to be happy. These little red worms like to live in the leaf litter naturally. And so they are happy in six inches of, of material. That's where they want to be. They're not going to try to get out of your bin. So you can build a bin, you can buy, there's all kinds of products like worm wigwams and worm condos that you you can buy for your worms, but you can just build a, you know, a little bin for your worms. Worms eat up to half of their body weight in food scraps a day. So uh, these little red wigglers. So if you have a pound of worms, you can put a half a pound of food scraps in there a day and they will eat it. It's pretty incredible. Oh my God. How many worms are in a pound of worms? Oh my gosh. I think like a thousand. I mean, it's a lot. They're little. Yeah. And so if that makes you squeamish, if the thought of like a bunch of little squiggly worms, like grosses you out, don't do composting. But it is a method that a lot of people love. And, you know, if it doesn't gross you out. Some people love the worms and they're like, the worms are my pets. I love the worms. Yes. Yeah, you've just got a thousand new pets, right? Yeah. And the vermicompost that comes off of the worm poop, basically, that is some of the highest quality compost that you can have or buy. If you Google, you know, buying vermicompost, it's really expensive. And so that is really great soil amendment. It's some of the best for starting seeds. So it is really great stuff and it's you know a proven method. You can do it anywhere. You can do it in your kitchen. You do not need a whole lot of brown material, which is the nice thing about worms, right? Amazing. So if I'm just in an apartment, I don't have leaves, I can just be throwing my food scraps. Wait, but how do you, when you want to extract the compost, how do you get the compost out without getting all the worms? That is the trickiest part. So the best method I have found is you get a pair of old pantyhose or you can get the mesh bags off of like oranges or, you know, onions come in. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm following. So you put a bunch of food scraps in that. If you've got the pantyhose, you make some little holes in it, right? So that they can get in. And you put that on one end of the worm bin and you don't put food scraps anywhere else. The worms will migrate over (laughs) to the the orange bag or whatever you've put the food scraps in. If you like for a week, they're all moving over there. And then you can take that and, you know, the area around it and move that into a temporary bin. And now you've got vermicompost that's mostly worm free, but you still have some worms. So another thing you could do, they don't like light. So if you spread them out, like on a tarp and you make little pyramids of worm poop, The worms will naturally go down into the bottom of the pile and you can kind of scrape off the top and it's just the vermicompost. I'm sure there's tons of YouTube videos on how to do this. (laughs) I'm sure there is. But I will say that it is the most intense harvesting that you have to do. Like with most composting, you don't have to be that intimately involved in the process, but it is hard. And some people just decide we're just going to set this aside and these worms are going to die and sacrifice those worms, which is fine if they're, they'll become part of the compost. But you want to be able to continue on and keep some of those alive for the next batch. Right. Because I guess I could vermicompost and not have a garden in an apartment and not really worry about extracting the compost for my plants. Just vermicompost. And when I have a full bin, I could just dump it outside, including the worms. So probably like an agriculture extension person would not be happy with you about that because they are an invasive species. And depending on where you live, well, almost all worms in North America are, but probably that's not the best 
method because they may survive and then you may be introducing an invasive species. So it's better try not to introduce the worms. It's likely, depending on where you live, that they wouldn't survive. They might, you know, die off. But yeah, you want to be careful with that. But how long is it going to take for, you know, if I have a nice, because I feel like I see vermicomposting people just have the tubs like under their sink or like, you know, in their kitchen. Also, does it smell? It does not. So with vermicomposting, it's just a nice earthy smell. It kind of smells like when you, uh, you know, turn over the garden for the first time Mm -hmm. in the spring. You do want to avoid citrus in a vermicompost. You were asking about things that you can't compost specifically with vermicompost. For some reason, when you add citrus, there's these little white bugs that show up and they just, the worms just aren't really crazy about citrus. So I would avoid orange peels, lemon peels, that kind of thing. Do you have to put holes in the bin or can it be a completely... Yes, you have to have holes because they do need air to breathe. Okay. And you have to start the bin with kind of some... I think the best thing is shredded newspaper and with a little bit of, of ground up leaves in it. They do need aeration. They can't just be like, okay. you know... Oh, and newspaper can be a brown. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, that's great. Because if you're in an apartment, you're definitely going to have access to newspaper if you don't have access to leaves. Okay, cool. So if worms are not your journey, what would be another option for indoor composting? So there's a few fun methods that I highlighted in no waste composting. One is bokashi. And bokashi is a Japanese fermentation of your food scraps that's very popular in Japan. It's really more pre-composting. This is not, you know, finished material when you've got it. A lot of times people who use bokashi just don't want to have to take it out to the bin every day or every other day, like out to their compost bin. And so they will, um, you know, do the bokashi or they live in a really urban environment and they're bringing it to like a community garden and they only want to do like once a month or something. And so you have a container and it, it smells a lot like pickles or, you know, some other kind of high vinegar material, but you are at, you have to use special bokashi grain, So you do have to buy that, Um, but you put your food scraps in and this is an anaerobic process. So you are pushing out the air, you're layering food scraps with the Bokashi grain, and you're basically fermenting your food scraps. And it, it, you know, you do it in, you know, five gallon bucket size, you can do it inside and it takes a long time to fill up the bucket. Then once you have it, it still kind of looks like food scraps, but it decomposes really quickly. So there's a few things you can do with it once you're finished. You can add it to a backyard compost bin if you have that. If you don't, you can bury it. You can dig like a trench and it will decompose really quickly. Or you can bring it to, you know, a community garden or, you know, someplace like that. But it, you know, depending on the size of your household, it could take a month, two months to fill up this bucket. And so that's a nice method for if you are stuck in an apartment and you can't be composting in your backyard. Yeah. I've heard about this Bokashi tea as well. Like you can extract the juice and use that as fertilizer. Right. So it does create, the method creates a liquid. And so most of the Bokashi buckets will have a little um, spout at the bottom. Like a spout. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you pull that out and it is very potent. You have to dilute it. I think it's maybe 10 parts water to one part uh, Bokashi, but the tea is really high nitrogen fertilizer. You can use it on your plants. It's a great fertilizer, but you can't just pour it right on your plants. It is really strong. Okay. Don't burn your plants. Yeah. There's an influencer I follow her who does that, which looks very interesting. Okay. Anything else with indoors? And also what are the top mistakes you see indoor composters making? One method before I get to the mistakes is the terracotta pot composting. And so this is really popular in India. And then there's some parts of Peru that it's really popular. It's for a lot of urban areas that they only have like a little bit of outdoor terrace or outdoor balcony. And these are, you know, these pots that you stack on top of each other. They're terracotta, so they're breathable. And you use cocoa peat as your brown. And you are basically putting your food scraps in there. It's a drier process than backyard composting. You're putting your food scraps in there. You're adding the cocoa peat on top to prevent fruit flies. And I did it in my kitchen for three months and it didn't create an odor at all. It can have mold though in it. So that's why I recommend in the book that you do it on a uh, patio or, you know, a, a little, it doesn't take up much space, but you, I think it's better outdoors, but it is a great method to, and then you have finished compost that, that is finished compost that you can use. You kind of juggle the, the, when you fill up the top one, you move it down and you, 
bring up an empty one um, and then allow that to finish composting. Um, so the terracotta pots are really, really interesting. And then there is, you know, if you have an, an apartment, you can get a machine like a Lomi or, you know, a, a machine like that, that will dehydrate and grind up your food scraps into little tiny pieces. And it looks like finished soil. It's not truly composting, but that's like a pre-composting. Then you can, you know, add those food scraps um, to your garden or, you know, into the backyard. That is a method of, you know, some people really love in their apartments. Yeah. I'm a Lomi lover. I've had one for a couple of years. And for me, as someone who hasn't really had an interest in composting and, you know, in the beginning of my sustainability journey, it's definitely been my gateway to learning more. And I like that I can just throw my food scraps in it and I don't have to worry that much about it. And I can put my cardboard, I can put, you can put cheese and I mean, I can put a lot of stuff in there and I feel like it's keeping food out of my waste bin. And then I just put my Lomi, you know, whatever you want to call it in my, in the forest near me. But I hear you that it's not technically living compost because it's dehydrated and, but add it to your compost pile and you're keeping food out of, you know, your garbage bag, which is cool. What about outdoors? So what are a couple, you know, a lot of gardeners listening to this podcast. So what are some great composting options for outdoor gardeners? So I think the outdoor composting falls into two buckets, so to speak. You have the bin systems. So you have lots of different systems where you contain it in a bin. And then you have kind of the in-garden systems. So I'll talk about the bin systems since they're the most common. The, probably the most common way that people backyard compost is to purchase a black, usually recycled plastic backyard bin. Is that the one that you like crank and it turns? That is a tumbler and that's one way. So the tumbler is going to be up off the ground. It's going to be in a you know fully enclosed system and it has a nice crank on the side. Um, tumblers do require a little bit more maintenance since they are uh, separated from the ground and you can't just naturally have, you know, the organisms coming up into it and the, you know, extra water going down. So if you have a tumbler, it's great. You're going to be able to get finished compost really quickly, but you're going to have to, you know, babysit it a little bit more. You're going to have to make sure you have a good mix of browns and greens. I think that's the most common mistake of people using tumblers is that they forget to add the browns and they just add the, the food scraps and it gets kind of mushy and yucky. Oh, because the natural microorganisms from the earth cannot participate because it's severed. It's disconnected. Yeah. And they're on your food. I mean, you're getting organisms in there, but yeah, it is a little disconnect. You're not going to get worms in there. It's it's going to be a little bit higher maintenance, but you can really successfully. I think the easier method are the ones that are right on the ground and they're open to the earth. Sometimes they look kind of like the bottomless. Okay. So they're bottomless. So they're basically, it's like a tube almost with a top. Right. And it usually has a locking lid to keep out animals. It's it the black usually they're almost always black and that's because it attracts sunlight. So it's going to help heat it up faster. It's going to hold in the moisture. I do have to take my lid off sometimes if I know it's going to rain so to add a little bit of water. Um, you can also build a bin though. You don't have to, to buy one. I have instructions in no waste composting for building a pallet bin, which pallets are really accessible. And that's kind of more aesthetic too, to have a nice wooden, I feel like I've seen that the like wooden box that you're just like chucking all your stuff in. Right. Yeah. And, and it's really just about what's going to look good in your garden, what fits, fits you the best. I will say um, it is nice to have, at least if you buy the black plastic to at least have two so that you can be adding to one while the other one's cooking, so to speak. And then you don't have to worry about once one's full, then the next one is complete compost and ready to harvest. And you don't have to try to separate what's not quite finished compost with the finished. So I think that's the easiest. And with the plastic, do you have to turn it? Like, do you have to get in there and mix it up and stir it so it cooks? So you do need to aerate it. I think if you want finished compost, you can be a lazy composter and just throw it in there and it'll take, you know, a couple years and it'll be finished compost. But if you want it to be finished in six months, you know, in a relatively short amount of time, it is better to get in there and just, you, you don't even necessarily need to fully turn it like you would with a tumbler. You really want to get in there and get the air in and that's going to help it finish composting. And how do you recommend doing that? So I have something called a wing digger, which is basically like a fancy metal stick that has a little metal prong at the end. And it 
it pokes down in and then as you're pulling it up, the flaps open up and it adds air. Oh, cool. It's a great product, but you can also just use a stick. <laughs> you could, you really, yeah, pitchfork, um, anything that's going to get the air down in there. You're really just trying to poke air down in there to get that aerobic bacteria active again. Okay. So you don't have to be like turning the compost, kind of getting it all over you. I could see it like getting all over my arms. It's more just sticking a stick in there, wiggling it around to make sure that there's like a, basically a tunnel for the air to get to the bottom. And how do you know it's done? (laughs) So finished compost is going to smell earthy. It's going to be brown and crumbly. It's going to look like something you would want to put in your garden. Um, You're not going to have any visible food scraps. There's always going to be something, you know, an avocado pit or sometimes eggshells that aren't quite finished, but you can really tell just by the smell. It's also not going to be super hot. If it's still hot, If there's still steam coming off of it, it's likely still actively composting and you need to let it do its thing. So it shouldn't be much warmer than air around it. Let's stick with the black bucket technique because that feels like probably the easiest, lowest cost and effort. Walk me through if I buy one tomorrow or if I make one tomorrow and I set it up on my lawn. Walk me through like what's the life cycle? How long is it going to be until I get my first compost How do I kind of nurture that baby so that I'm doing it right? So if you're impatient and you want finished compost quickly, I would say, and you're aerating it, you're getting a good mix of the browns to the greens, and you're making sure that it's staying pretty moist. You want it to be about as wet as a wrung out sponge. So you don't want it too wet, but you want it, you know, some moisture in there for those microorganisms. You can get finished compost in, you know, four months um, to six months. I think that's fast. Um, especially if you're, com- if you're beginning a uh, beginner compost, um, if you, there's a method called hot composting where you can get compost in a month, but that is really intense and it's a lot of work. <laughs> and so if you're super impatient, you can look into that, but I would say most people, it's going to be six months. I actually harvest my bends once a year, but I also have two very active kids and I'm a very busy person. So, you know, I don't really need compost more than once a year. So that's how often I'm doing it. Now I have multiple bins, so I get some compost in the spring and then I'm harvesting one in the fall. <laughs> so, well, I was going to say, cause I'm thinking, I'm trying to think back, okay, if this is going to take me six months, but I want the compost when I'm like planting up my garden in May, then I should start it. You know, like there's a little bit of math. But that's smart that you have two. So you have a fall and a spring compost harvest. So you have to water it like a plant. So you say you just take the top off when it rains so it gets wet and then you put the top back on. Yeah. And I mean, the food scraps that you're adding will have water to it. So most of the year you don't need to water it. It's when it is getting really hot and you know, you're know you getting a lot of evaporation. You're probably going to want to add water. I recommend, I mean, you can just put the hose in there, but there is chlorine in the water. So that's going to kill some of your microorganisms. They'll come back. It'll be all right. But I tend to fill up a bucket of water and let the chlorine evaporate and then add the water in. I just feel like I'm taking better care of my little microorganism buddies. And can you add microorganisms to a compost? Like, should I think about adding earthworms or adding mycorrhizae or adding stuff? So there are products out there that are like accelerators that, you know, um, will add, add beneficial microorganisms. I really don't think they're necessary. You know, you could add some stale beer, <laughs> That's going to add some high nitrogen. There's microorganisms on your food scraps. I recommend when you're starting your pile. So if you imagine that you've just bought that bin, you add a good foot, maybe two feet of shredded up leaves. And then you add a little bit of either finished compost or a nice shovel full of garden soil. That's going to have all the microorganisms you need. If you want to get fancy and try to buy the microorganisms, you can. I've talked to composters who swear by that. It's, you know, this mix makes my compost faster and that's, that's great, but you don't really need it. There's microorganisms everywhere. Okay. So if I want to do this right, I'm buying my bin, putting it in my yard. Anything about the setup? Am I just plopping it on some grass? Do I have to like dig it out? You don't have to dig it out. You can put it on grass. You want to make sure that it's not too close to a medium-sized tree 
because that tree will, or shrub, it will grow its roots up into the pile if it's too close. So you want to think about that. It doesn't matter if it's in sun or shade, it will decompose. So that's not a big factor. You do want it to be close enough to your house that you're going to walk out and use it. Actually take the food scraps out, like in the snow or in the winter, you know, in the rain, that kind of stuff. Okay. Right. But you also need to be able to work around it. So, you you know, think about that. If you put it in too tight of an area that you're not able to lift the bin up off the, the pile, then it might cause you problems when you're harvesting. Okay. So it's going on there. We've picked one that's not, not too close to a tree. You mentioned you're putting, did you say two feet or two inches of brown on the bottom? I usually put at least a foot, if not two, of shredded leaves. So if you can shred them. Can't be newspaper, has to be leaves. It can be newspaper. It can be newspaper. Shredded leaves are better. Leaves are the best brown that you can use. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One, they're they're natural, so they have the microorganisms on it. Usually most people have a lot of leaves, but it creates a really nice color to your finished compost. That's why I said add a little bit of leaves to your vermicompost. You'll get a nicer brown versus gray vermicompost. But the leaves are great they're because they're all natural. If you don't have leaves, I mean, there's some times of the year that you're like, I'm not going to have leaves for a few months. You can use shredded newspaper. You can use it, really any shredded paper, as long as it's not, you know, real laminated or something like that. I don't really like colored paper, like, um, like magazines. I think that it's not really available. You can use wood chips and wood chips are great for adding to that bottom layer because they're going to add, they're going to make it so that you have a nice airflow through your pile. Wood chips are not, because they're so dense, it's harder for the microorganisms to eat them, if that makes sense. They're, it's considered not available carbon. Like it's going to take longer. And so they're going to struggle a little bit versus like sawdust is the exact opposite. Like it is really available. You could add sawdust if you've got it, if you need a little bit of carbon, but it's, they're going to eat it really fast because they're like tiny little pieces. Got it. Okay. So you're doing the two foot layer of that. And does that count for the first dose of brown? So then I can put one quarter of that of food scraps immediately in, or then do I add more brown in my first dose of food scraps? I would definitely add brown every time you add food scraps or have a little uh, garden fork and bury your food scraps. You never want to be able to see your food scraps when you look into the compost bin for a few reasons. One, fruit flies. They're on the food that you bring home from the grocery store and you will get them in your bin if you're not covering them up. If you're not, the fruit flies don't burrow down in. So if you're covering with a good layer of leaves, you should be fine. But then also it just odors, just attracting animals. If you're bearing at food scraps, it's much less likely that your neighborhood squirrel is going to want to see what's in your bin. Is there a practice that you keep sawdust or wood shavings or something so that if you don't have leaves for that moment, you cover it in something else? I've even used pizza boxes. I mean, you can use what you have. So oh, cool. Okay, so you just toss the pizza box on top to cover the food. Right, to cover it. Um, sawdust, wood chips, newspaper, all of those things would be considered a carbon, but covering it is key. Okay, so I'm doing that every time, you know, I've set it up. So I'm thinking like, I'm gonna start this in the fall where all the leaves are available so I can get two feet of, of leaves really easily. Then I'm, you know, out of my food scraps, I'm covering it with pizza boxes and newspaper and leaves and all of that. And is there a method to that badness? Or basically, when I have the food scraps, I'm throwing it in, I'm adding that and I'm just letting it do its thing. Yeah, that's how most people compost because that fits your life, right? You're you're adding it as you have them. I usually take my bin out every other day. I'm adding food scraps. I keep so I have my black plastic bin. I keep a, a wire bin filled with leaves next to it, and then just add leaves every time I add my food scraps. And that way I'm covering it, but I'm also adding that carbon just naturally. And then my other bin, that's a bin, like a bay system, I have leaves on one side and I'm adding food scraps to the other. So I think that that is the easiest way. You can do what's called batch composting, which actually does speed up the composting process, but then you have to hold on to your food scraps. So if you have like a deep freeze or some method of doing that where you can hold on to your food scraps for a month, then that's great. But most of us just don't live like that. And so it's easier to just add it every other day or so. And then in terms of maintenance, I'm sticking my stick in there and aerating it. And that's pretty much it. And then I'm just waiting for it to cook. And if I do things 
the normal way I should expect it six to eight months. Yeah. So if you're a super composter and you really want to stay on it and, and aerate it once a week, that's great. There's no reason to aerate it more often than once a week. I aerate mine probably once a month, but like I said, I'm, I'm a pretty busy mom. So, and it's fine. It's, I can't finish compost. It, it works. It's fine. You want to, when you aerate it or when you're adding the food scraps, keep an eye on, especially the leaves in your pile will tell you. If you pick up a handful and crunch and it's just like dry and crunchy, you probably need to add some water. If you are picking up and it looks really sloshy, then you probably need to add some more browns. It's probably too wet. Okay. Or there's too much food scraps and it's not, and and the balance is off. And then, you know what I'm just grasping? So like I've, okay. So say I've built this and my thing is 75% full, right? With the compost. And I put a banana peel on the top of the compost. Obviously I cover it with the newspaper after. You're not stirring it and breaking the banana. So when, I mean, I guess this is really dumb, but the microbes are coming up from the compost and covering that banana and breaking it down so that eventually that banana just won't be there anymore. It will have completely deteriorated and turned into compost just by itself. Like I'm not having to break it up. And, you know, when I look at my loamy, the loamy is like basically dehydrating and it's turning and turning and turning. These things are just sitting and decomposing and turning into that's magic. Yeah, it is magic. And I will say if you have like a watermelon or a pumpkin and and you can cut it up a little bit, that'll make the microorganisms job easier, right? There's more surface area for them to break it down. So that's the only time that I really worry if I have melon or, you know, something like that that I want to break down. But yeah, those microorganisms are amazing and they are uh, really doing a lot of work and we we owe them everything as composters. <laughs> So what we just discussed, no, truly, shout out to the microorganisms. You're amazing. What we just discussed, I can't believe we're at an hour already. We've been talking about compost for an hour. But so this method that we just kind of in-depth talked through is for the, you know, the pallet kind of more open air pallet situation that you make or the black barrel. And I feel like that's pretty much what most people are going to explore. You go over so many different options in your book in your books, plural, but are there any other cool, we don't have to walk through like what we just did, but any other cool composting modalities that you might just want to give us like a high level introduction to? And then if we're interested in going that way, instead of what you just taught us, we could get your book and dive, dive deeper. Yeah. So definitely there's something called Hugel culture. Yes. And so it is very cool. And I bring it up because so many people uh, garden in raised beds. You can actually, instead of paying a fortune for soil to fill up your raised bed, you can actually practice hugoculture at the bottom of a raised bed. So this is taking sticks and um, manure and things, uh, you know, really like wood, like logs that take a long time to break down and lining the bottom of your raised bed with that and then adding the soil. And what that does is it slowly decomposes and it creates, it's like a spongy, um, material that will help that bed hold water better. It's, it's really very interesting. And this is all a practice in permaculture. And so um, usually Hugel culture is like a mound that you would dig almost like a ditch, add things up and then mound it up into a bed. But you can actually do Hugel culture in the bottom of a raised bed, which I think is really cool. That's so cool because I'm going to do raised beds when I move because I like the higher raised beds. They're just so much easier to garden in. I love the idea of taking that Hugel culture approach, which I feel like I've seen more and more about online and, you know, in garden as permaculture is more. Also, I thought that African keyhole garden idea was pretty cool. Can you talk about that? Yes. So I built one at my in-laws house. I unfortunately didn't build one at my house and I regret it because they're so cool. So it is basically a wire compost bin in the middle. And if you imagine a ring around that, which is a raised garden, but instead of a complete circle, there's a little keyhole cut out so that you can walk to the bin and add things to the bin. And this is a method um, that's really popular in parts of Africa where their soil is really degraded and they need to garden in a raised bed. And they have food scraps, obviously, but they're also, it's usually in a really hot climate where they don't have easy access to water. And so this is a way that you can 
use compost as a way to water the garden bed around it and add nutrients to the garden bed around it. It's a very interesting method and it really does work. And you don't have to be in a, you know, a really hot, dry climate for it to work. It can work anywhere, but it's, it is really, and you can build the garden out of so many cool things. You can go down a rabbit hole of watching YouTube videos of people building them out of wine bottles and you would not believe it. There's so many different ways you can do it, but it is a lot of fun. So cool. Well, you are such a resource on composting. Your books are incredible. They're so accessible. You really explain everything really well. Thank you for walking me through, you know, my composting journey. I'm definitely probably going to do the standard black. Well, maybe, I don't know if I, it's just going to look so ugly. If I do the black bin, can I like put bricks around it or something to hide it? Like, do people hide the black bins? You could, you know, the easiest way to harvest the compost, though, is to pick the bin up and take it off of the compost pile. Oh, and then you just have the pile of compost. So, yeah. So if you've got bricks around it, that might make that a little slower. I mean, you might want to just plant, you know, some fast growing vines or something up it that you could just tear off and it wouldn't be a big deal if you wanted to. Oh, yeah. I like that idea. Or maybe I'll do the pallet technique. If you do the pallet technique, are you covering it? What are you covering it with? So yeah, you can leave the top of it open. I put an optional lid on the one that I um, wrote instructions for. So you can cover it with just newspaper or cardboard or whatever, but you can then also have a lid if you wanted to really keep out like raccoons or, you know, bigger animals that might try to get into it. Very cool. Okay. Well, that's definitely going to be my journey. I'm so excited to get started. Where can people find you and where can people find your books? They're so great. And if you are interested in going on your composting journey, I highly recommend them. So um, I am on Instagram with, uh, under compost geek. So you, you can follow me there. But you can find both composting for new generation and no waste composting anywhere books are sold. So you know, Amazon or any bookstore. Cool. I'm following you on Instagram right now compost geek. Yeah, I can't wait to learn from you and go get those books. They're so good. What's the newer one? The newer one is no waste composting. So that has more small space composting methods. Really, I tried to push the reuse. So finding ways of making bins out of what you already have. Composting for a new generation is a little bit longer and it goes into a little bit more science of composting. Yeah, I love it. So any any geeks, any nerds out there might like that one. Well, thank you, Michelle. This was such a great conversation. And maybe we'll have you back on in a year for a composting update. All right, I would love that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That conversation was so good. She really enlightened us. She really taught us a lot. I can't believe I'm excited about compost. Like, I can't wait. We're hopefully getting a house in the next year or so. And I can't wait to be a little bit more in control of my home so that I can do things like have a compost setup. I like her palette idea. I don't know which style I'm going to go with when we get there, but I really like the palette idea that she was talking about. If you want to learn more and kind of go into more detail about the things that we discussed here, Michelle has two different books. One is called No Waste Composting, and the other one is called Composting for a New Generation. So you can check those both out. We're going to have the links in the show notes. And if you're interested in getting yourself a Lomi, you can also go to growingjoywithmaria.com slash Lomi to learn more about it. And I believe the code GROWINGJOY gets you $50 off your Lomi. And it's an investment. So $50 off is a nice chunk. Like I said, we've used ours for two years literally every night. And it's completely changed my view of food waste. And it's also magic. Like you put your food in, you press the button, you wake up in the morning and there's potting mix and it smells nice. It's wild. You really have to experience it to understand how magical it is. So anyway, I hope this episode was interesting. It was really fascinating to me. I hope it supports you in your garden endeavors as we move into the growing season. And I hope more than anything, my plant friends, it helps you keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the plant parent personality test. 
It's free, it's super fun, it takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're gonna get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.